Uh, welcome. Uh, this is the uh, add-on development panel. Uh, so um, there's been a lot of talk about community uh, and uh, started up to about five or so years ago, add-on development has not had too much of a community. There's been small pockets, uh, but we really wanted to start forming a more official uh, community of add-on developers so that we could talk about some of the problems that we run into to encourage uh, and support new developers to come in, add-on developers, um, to show the artists that some of the, some of the problems that uh, need to get solved are not too hard, that uh, you, can, you can come, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there are some additional functionality in Blender that uh, if added would make it a little bit easier, but, it, uh, but bring, in, bring in them this ability to um, create in a different way. Uh, so uh, we are here to talk about uh, some of the stuff that we have done and uh, to open, uh, to have a bit of a discussion with, with you all um, about uh, what, what problems um, or you know, what problems did 2.8 solve when it comes to scripting? It's done a tremendous amount of work toward UI and for the artist side, but what has it done for the development, add-on development side? Um, and maybe where are still some places that need uh, a little bit more work to make it easier for new, uh, new developers to come on um, and kind of grow. So um, is there anything else? I think uh, the, this would definitely be a spirit, or the hope is, the spirit of this is, is a discussion, not necessarily feature requests. Uh, so we're not here to tell the Blender dev, uh, the core dev development team, here are some things that we want, but here are uh, some kind of sticky points uh, that make it a little bit more difficult to, to develop. Um, maybe some small features will, will kind of come from this, uh, but, um, but that's not uh, not necessarily the uh, the point of of discussion. So um, I don't think there's any particular reason why we need to to stand. But if you want to sit, uh, I will uh, start by just uh, uh, we'll just go down the row. Uh, many of you know us um, and some of the work that we've done. Uh, but for those that don't, uh, I'd like to give just a short introduction. So I am uh, John Denning. Uh, I work with CG Cookie. Um, I'm also a professor at Taylor University. Uh, teaching computer science, computer graphics, computer vision, all sorts of computer things. Um, at CG Cookie, I've worked on uh, an add-on called Retopoflow. Uh, so uh, re, re, uh, retopologizing uh, 3D models. Um, so some of the problems that we've run into uh, that we needed to solve were um, having quick access to um, uh, vertices and edges and faces. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, you know, a surrounding. So we do a lot of, of uh, painting, um, the relax and tweak look at surrounding vertices. Uh, so we needed real quick access to what vertices were visible um, and um, um, what are their connectivity. BMesh does some good stuff. BBH, uh, the bounding volume hierarchy, has some good acceleration structures, but didn't quite meet uh, some of the needs that we needed. Um, we also wanted to use uh, some special rendering. Um, so when the symmetry uh, mirroring was turned on, uh, there was a clear indication of where that uh, symmetry was happening. Um, and so we do some, we do some very specialized uh, rendering. We also render the target or the, the low version, the retopology uh, mesh on top of the source, uh, which required some, some specialized shaders. So we do lots and lots of like very specialized rendering uh, we collect a lot of data, um, and and uh, we wanted to make it feel like it was its own editor, its own mode. Uh, so we we created our own UI um, and kind of uh, built up from there. So mu much of the problems were some fundamental or not fundamental, but uh, low level stuff dealing with the with the meshes and the topology, um, but also a lot of rendering. So I'll start or I'll end there. Um, there'll be lots more discussion, but um, I want to give the other panelists some time to talk, so. All right, hey, I'm Christopher Gerhardt. Um, at this point, I've worked on uh, at least one to two dozen add-ons. Um, 
So I started off uh, doing Lego animation. I run a YouTube channel. Um, and that led into uh, being very interested in developing Blender add-ons for those who are doing Lego animation um, and using Blender as well. Um, so I made an add-on on the Blender market called Bricker. Um, and that was the first big add-on that I made. Um, and it converts 3D objects and even smoke and water simulations into Lego bricks and Lego simulations. Um, and then those can be constructed in real life. Um, so that's where I started, and I uh, made a, a whole suite of LEGO animation tools from there. And then I got to work with uh, John Denning on uh, Rotopa Flow, um, on some CG cookie work. And then um, I got to work with Patrick Moore, who uh, gave a talk yesterday on his dentistry uh, add-ons. Um, worked worked on, with him on some really interesting problems that uh, we've released a lot of these add-ons on um, either Blender Market or GitHub as free, uh, free open source add-ons. Um, and yeah, I'm now working uh, at Crane doing um, add-on development, pulling a bunch of software packages into Blender uh, using the uh, Python API. Um, so that's what I've been working on. <laughs> I've got my own microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Wiebren van Keulen. Uh, I'm the creator of The Grove. This is a natural tree growing add-on for Blender. I started out as a, an architectural visualization artist. I've been doing that for maybe 15 years. And five years ago, uh, so I'm really an artist turned coder. So five years ago, I had a couple of weeks off and I just thought, well, I need better trees. Let's, let's give it a try in Python and what, what I can do. It was more like a joke, like let's, I have some free time on my hands. So before you know it, when you start coding in Blender, it's, it's really addictive. It's, it's one of the most, uh, most rewarding things to do. It's m more than art, even for me. And so uh, I have a little bit of a coding background, but even then, it's, it's a little, lot, of, lot of problem solving, and it, you build upon something that grows bigger and bigger. And yeah, well, here we are. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sibren Stuvel. I work at the Blender Institute, and uh, well, the, the biggest add-on that I've made so far is the, the Blender Cloud add-on. So, <laughs> thank you. That combines a whole lot of different parts into one big add-on. Um, and I think the, the first thing I did was work on the texture browser, which connects to the network, connects to Blender Cloud, loads all those textures in, allows you to browse through all that there is uh, on the cloud, and you click on it, it downloads the texture, you can use it in your project. And you can then also easily switch between different resolutions of, uh, of your images. And another part of that is um, Flamenco, which is our render farm, uh, render farm software. So you can just click on a button, render on Flamenco, and then we'll pack the blend file together with everything it needs. So if it links in characters from other blend files, it will also take those other blend files into consideration. If that link into yet other blend files that use certain texture files, they all come along uh, into what we call a bat pack, the, the Blender Asset Tracer pack. And this is also a, a point where there was a lot of issues with um, how do you bundle external stuff into Blender itself? Because bat is a separate project, so I wanted to have that developed in its own repository with its own bug tracker and its own its own life, basically, because you can use it as a standalone tool, but it's also used by the Blender Cloud add-on, so it should also be able to be loaded from other Python code, but it's not bundled with Blender itself because the Blender Cloud add-on is not bundled with Blender. So that was all trickery of how do I load it from what turned out to be a wheel file, uh, load that into Blender's memory, and my approach that I thought of is now giving some problems when other people copy it. Uh, but we can go, go into more detail later on. So now that we have um, most of the people, hopefully, that are in here, uh, I'm assuming that be because of the description and the title of the talk, most of you are <coughs> developers or thinking about being add-on developers. But I, I was just kind of curious. How many have written a script in Blender to do something? Good, good. Now, how many have written an add-on, so like an operator or a menu item? Well, oh, good, good, good. Uh, how many use the Blender text editor as their primary way of, of writing scripts? <laughs> we'll start there. Yeah. 
What about an external editor? Should be the rest, right? So like VS Code, Sublime Text, Notepad. <laughs> Emacs. Um. <laughs> Atom. Atom, yes. Okay. Vim, yes. I, I, had, a, I had a good friend, uh, VI, so VI and Vim, they're cousins. Uh, he said, he, he said you could never, you can never spell evil without VI. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, another question: How many use regularly the Blender console in, in it? And uh, is there something specific that you use it for? Do you like execute a specific thing, or what? What do you use it for? Everything. Everything. <laughs> Finding finding the functions. Yeah. You, it need to, you need to keep it for the Yes. Comments. Yes, thank you. Or there is a while of hunting for the for the audio. Very good idea. Thank you. So uh, uh, it was to be able to going from two seventy nine to two eighty, there were some changes in uh, in the structure or the the organization of some of the functions. And so using the Blender console to be able to find because with autocomplete it's pretty convenient to start typing BPY dot, and then get a list of all the things and drill down to finding that one function. Good. Anything else, or is that it? Uh, it outputs every action that you do in Blender, so you can reverse engineer some of the things. So it outputs every, every action, so you can reverse engineer yeah. some of the, uh, the functionality? Yeah. Or, um, yes, okay. Anything else? Debugging. Debugging? How so? Uh, yeah. So rather than uh, than printing out uh, all of the the output, or I'm here now, I'm here now. It hasn't broken yet. Along the way, uh, you can you can execute line by line in the console and see where it breaks and play around with a couple of different you know, parameters to and see visually how, how everything uh, modifies. Good. Anything else? Or are those the primary, primary things? Uh, reloading's tough. Reloading? Yeah, so it just import, import lib, import lib.reload some module. Just reloading specific parts of my code. That's what I also use it for. I tend to always reload everything completely. <laughs> so. I also tend to use it when I've messed something up with my add-on development. Like if I'm if I've overwritten some parameter and I can't change it, I'll just go into the Python console and change the parameter myself. That happens too often. So I, I hope that uh, even though this is a panel, we're going to kind of talk about some of the stuff that we've done. We're very interested. I mean, this is a community thing. We just wanted to kind of get this started. So the, the intent of this is to be much more discussion. Uh, so um, hoping that we can we can have some some conversation there. So um, what are some of the other questions I have here? Um, those that have uh, um, just done a couple of of scripts, is there? Uh, do you feel like? Doing the scripts is enough for getting the, the you know solving the problem that you're looking for, that you don't quite cross over to making a full-on add-on or an operator, or is there something else that's keeping? Uh, I, I'm just kind of curious. Is there something else that's keeping you from, from moving from scripts to, to full-on add-ons? Basically, it's nervousness because I've, I started trying to do add-ons based on the templates that come in the uh, Blender text files, the text um, blocks, and because they have no real explanation of why they work, I always feel like I'm fumbling my way, tweak it a bit, 
oh, it hasn't crashed yet, good, I'll keep that. Um, and that doesn't really inspire self-confidence. Thank you. Yeah, so that's m most, mostly a documentation thing, and I think, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Mostly a documentation thing? Thank you. <laughs> uh, time. Uh, so uh, when you uh, have some specific task that you need to script because uh, it will save you time, a lot of time to script it, but uh, making it an add-on takes another amount of time, uh, which is sometimes not, not worth the effort. That's simply it. Not yeah, worth the effort because you only have a specific task and will have another spe specific task next year or so. Yeah. yeah, for me also, when I tweak the script to be just specific to that particular blend file, I don't want to generalize it and I don't want to have extra input parameters. I mean, I'm a developer myself. When I write it for myself, I often just put it in the blend file in the text block and just run it there. Also. Uh, maybe I would say that when you do something that is very specific uh, to something, it's good to be an add-on. But, but when, when you're working for something that will change in time and grow and everything, you, don't, you have the option either to do a, a very big one with everything or um, a, a big town of thousands of add-ons. So I tend to lean in the direction of trying to have something very gen generic that just loads outside the definition and stuff. So I'm using, uh, I'm, I think about using the add-on system as an entry, entry, one single entry point for everything we'll do in pipeline and stuff because these things are moving like by the hour. You can't manage uh, thousands of add-ons for thousands of uh, use. So you would go a little bit the same approach that I did with the Blender Cloud add-on and just have one add-on that has loads of different functionalities. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that uh, also is easier to share code between other DCCs and uh, contexts. Uh, I also have an, uh, an, uh, a new answer to the previous question uh, about using the uh, console. So uh, I often use it for batch processing of uh, objects, uh, pure modeling or of vertices or whatever. Okay, thank you. Who wants a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I do have other questions, so. Uh. Yeah, I have a question because uh, uh, the, it was mentioned to share code between add-ons and basically, um, I don't know if there are any plans to have like a dependency graph uh, for Blender add-ons because I stumbled upon that quite a couple of times mm -hmm. to have like stuff I would like to rely on, but it's very hard for the user to get it that you have to install this add-on in this version to get this add-on working. Mm -hmm. Don't know if it, there's a solution plan for that. I don't think there are plans currently for that, but I do think it, it sounds interesting. I mean, I've. Uh, I keep saying the same thing. I have that with the Blender Cloud add-on as well because it depends on the Blender ID add-on for, for authentication. And I would love it if you just enable the Blender Cloud add-on and then it says, okay, now I enable also the Blender ID add-on. It shouldn't be that hard to do. Yeah, um, this feature. <laughs> 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 okay, well, right now we're in the corner of feature requests, but oh. how I handled it was... Um, I checked for the functionality of the desired uh, plugin I wanted to have and then outputted it to the user in my panel. So, okay, this, uh, for me it was images as planes because I wanted, don't want it to rewrite it in my own code. So I said, okay, please install images as planes or activate it because it's included. And then well, the it's a workaround, but uh, for someone who wants to do it. I the good thing about Blender is that it's all scriptable anyway. So an add-on currently could already activate other add-ons. And oh, okay. if you Thank just you. want <laughs> to have some functionality inside your inside your add-on that another one provides, you can import it even when it's not activated. 
So you could say from uh, images as planes uh, import some useful function and then use that useful function in your own code. Good to know, but the uh, add-on itself has to be imported, so uh, it has to be there, so otherwise. Well, one, one thing that I always try um, to tell people when, when they're writing code and add-ons and everything, they write their own operators. I generally say, put your functional code in a separate function and then call that from your operator. And then you don't need to activate the whole add-on, you don't need to register all the operators in order to just get access to that useful bit of code. And if you structure it more in that way, it becomes easier as well. It's not applicable to every case, for sure, but it can help. Sometimes the, the add-on is just uh, maybe a very good menu or something. I mean, oh yes, it, then it's, then it's, it's a good way to work. It does not solve the, the issue. I think one of the big chances we have with open source is the experience from other projects. We should look at the Python packaging authority and the mess of every de package dependency history. What they are what they are going what they are doing in past few years to solve this, and we should just take the same uh, route and have it have a pip like uh, Blender pip install for add-ons, just straightforward. One of the key problems I see with uh, interdependency and the O dependency graph is that a lot of the time uh, the version heavily can can heavily change uh, the function names and the IP overall. So uh, the only uh, solid way I see of using other plugins uh, in your work is by including the code of it into your plugin. Uh, you can uh, make it into a sub module in, in Git. Uh, and use it like that. That is the only solid way that I found, at least. That, well, is of course a possibility, but I think what would be a better one, or if you can rotate the microphone a bit, yes. Um, I think what would be a better one is to actually contact the author of that add-on that you want to import and discuss with them on how to deal with uh, sharing code and uh, making sure that the, the interface is stable. Because if other people don't know that their code is being used in that way, they also won't make it as stable as you'd like. So I think collaboration here is the, the primary thing. Uh, collaborating big add-ons is a very hard thing. And uh, you don't want to be, you usually don't want to be chained down by other people saying that, well, we use that <laughs> stuff, so you, you can't change that, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's complicated. Of course, but then again, if nobody knows that it's being used in that way, even if they want to to help out, they, they're not able to. You don't want to be chained down, but at this point you want to use other work either. It's yeah. a it's matter of choice, it's collaboration. Hi. So, um, now let's go into a little bit of different direction, for me at least. <laughs> uh, I've been waiting for a while to, to be able to ask that kind of question. And I know you said you don't want to hear feature requests, and I try to formulate it in a way that it's not going to be a feature request. <laughs> um, I've been thinking for a while about a way to implement truly parametric objects into Blender, like uh, building a cube and or whatever, and being able to change all of the properties later down, just like in Cinema 4D or 3ds Max or whatever. And I was thinking maybe the modifier uh, API would be a good way to plug that in, because you could basically take an empty mesh object or so, and, and generate the desired geometry via a modifier. But that brings me to, to the actual question, is there any specific reason why the entire modifier API is not exposed to Python? Speed. Uh, the way it currently works is that they take in uh, a, a complete mesh and they possibly output a completely new unrelated mesh and there's a lot of data going through the system. So that's the main reason. Uh, but I think I know somebody is working on a parametric system under the guise of everything nodes. <laughs> 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 so, 
So I'm not working on parametric modeling right now, but that's the plan after particles. Um, another thing with having access to uh, implementing new modifiers using using Python, it's not only that the Python code itself might be slow, but also that it can only be single threaded. Um, that can can be solved by maybe calling some C code from Python again to unlock the global interpreter lock, but we try to avoid getting this API now because we want to replace the entire system anyway. So, yeah, doesn't make too much sense to add this functionality right now. If you need it for some studio or so, it's really easy to, to add a new modifier and get this kind of hook into Blender. This is actually done already. There's some thread on, on DevTalk where someone has done it, but I think it's not something that will end up in, in Blender. Um, anytime soon. Uh, to to add to the the speed thing with uh, Python, actually, if you look at uh, s some of the objects, if you add an object in Blender, some of the objects are actually generated with Python, and you can notice that sometimes it can be slower to add an object than to just completely make it with modifiers. So if you if you add a sphere uh, like UV sphere and make it super high res, and then you make exactly the same sphere with the same resolution with just one vertex and two screw modifiers, the two screw modifiers will be faster to generate that mesh than just adding it. So I don't think that Python is really suitable for this kind of mesh generation <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I have kind of another, another question. We'll see how long this one uh, goes for. So we had a lot of hands for those that have written scripts or an add-on. Is there anybody here um, who ha either hasn't written a script but is interested or has just started writing uh, or do doing uh, development, add-on development or scripting? Okay. I, okay. So my question uh, to you and anybody else, uh, if you can remember, you know, maybe you've been doing this for years, but if you can remember uh, back, was there anything that was really uh, a sticking point for switching or like starting that development and, and learning? Uh, you know, it may be it may be just learning how to write Python code, right? Uh, learning how to program, but uh, but are there other things that uh, with with development that we're causing a sticking point that if that were uh, made easier or better, maybe it's more templates uh, or more description, more comments or something like this. Uh, is there something that, that could be done that helps bring in new, new developers faster? Uh, I write. <laughs> I have written several things, uh, but I remember uh, back at the time uh, there was uh, this huge problem of uh, operators being context, context dependent. And uh, you see that Blender does this, then you try to write it as a line, and it doesn't do anything. It just uh, throws an error like, sorry, man, wrong context, <laughs> try again. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I've been um, writing and developing uh, scripts for quite a long time, but I'm also active on Blender Stack Exchange. And uh, the problem that I see uh, with a lot uh, of new uh, users is that um, perhaps the documentation could be improved. And uh, common problems that I see are, for instance, the um, uh, restricted context problem. So um, people try to call code um, before the add-on is properly registered, and they don't realize that that's, for instance, something that's not possible or, sh or shouldn't be done, um, accessing uh, BPI data um, before it's actually properly loaded. And um, also the context uh, thing, because um, I, I think that's still sometimes a bit tricky because you have to figure out how exactly um, to set a custom context. And um, that's not always really obvious, uh, obvious thing to do. First of all, finding out that you can, and are able to um, set a custom context and how it's supposed to be. And um, I think it would be a lot easier for newer users if this is properly documented. I mean, we already have like lots of threads on Blender Stack Exchange, so if you search for it, you'll find an answer. 
but um, like in the official documents. How okay. many people here have actually added something to the documentation because they found it lacking in an area? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's um, sometimes uh, the tooltip the Python tooltip don't say really where uh, you have to, the, I mean the path is truncated, you know, <laughs> and sometimes you don't find, uh, it's hard to find uh, the, the, end, uh, the end point of uh, the attribute you are, you are going to change. And uh, sometimes also another thing is um, I want to uh, throw a panel uh, somewhere or append a panel and uh, it's really hard to know what is the name of the area uh, to append the panel to, and uh, you look like uh, edit source to find the, the stuff or look online uh, sometimes for a long time before finding. That's my. I, th I think the edit source trick is actually pretty handy. I use it also all the time. And one thing for sure that you know is that it's not out of date. Yeah. And that's that's what I really like about it. <coughs> when I see your T-shirt, Severin, import BPI. In the beginning starting developing scripts, you do it from within uh, the console or the text editor from within Blender because you don't have otherwise access to BPI. And so when I started having longer scripts and so on, I started to do it in my own uh, environment and independent of Blender so I could debug things really thoroughly. And that meant I had to compile the whole of Blender as an independent BPI uh, module, and that happens not to be always easy, I noticed, because at least in Linux, uh, it can take some time until you get everything fixed. There are good, let's say, not documentations, official, but, well, guys, I can't remember, Campbell maybe, or one of those guys gave like a recipe to do it, but it's not working all the time, depending yeah. on your... Nowadays, so I was wondering, are there plan to, you know, maybe ship an official BPI module with? I'm not aware of any plans in that area. Uh, it has been made simpler now. I think you can just do make BPY and then it builds it as a Python module. Mm. Um, there was also people who generate uh, Python stubs from BPY so that your IDE can load the stubs and you have the code completion without having to mm -hmm. actually load BPY. Uh, but there's all kinds of problems with IDEs and and importing Blender stuff. I have a ticket open at the um, IntelliJ, at the, the PyCharm guys, about reloading. The if be some name in locals, mm. some name is reload the thing and otherwise import it. That thing that you see all the time in our in our scripts, PyCharm doesn't understand any of it even though it's valid Python. And I think I found a bug in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't fixed it yet. Okay, then it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess many, uh, many coders who are very into Blender would say, well, as in a beginner, you uh, can research a little and uh, everything's there. So if you want to find out how to use a certain or how to categorize an, uh, a tab, uh, uh, panel, uh, it's there. Look in the, in the code of Blender or so. Uh, but uh, uh, I think when I started uh, coding Blender, what I was missing was a place where, where it's all uh, put together in a way that non-coders can understand it. So uh, people who never uh, visited a, a university class or so. Uh, and uh, where all these things at least links to how are the pedals called, how, uh, what is the anatomy of a uh, operator and what ha does it have to do with uh, um, OOP and what doesn't it? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, 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 like all these these things, and these things may be also documented by some non-professional coders, uh, because uh, that's how P 
people who get who are new think about it. Uh, you don't have the mindset of a professional coder. Yeah, maybe I can just um, uh, take an addition to this uh, because I remember that um, what helped me a lot was the examples uh, given by Campbell. So um, yeah. back in, I don't know, 2016 or even longer, um, there have been some examples how to create a panel, how to create the operator, how to create uh, this and that. And this really helped me out because the code was very good documented. And um, a lot of people, when they start code, they don't know exactly how code works and how semantics works, but they take examples and then they fiddle their way up. So yeah. what we really would um, benefit from is, is like a, a bigger source of examples, maybe also a repository with example uh, plugins uh, doing simple stuff or just uh, bringing in the bare bones and the structure you can build up on. So what is the gap then between uh, in the text editor go to templates Python and have that whole list of examples and what you want? Where, where's the disconnect between what we have right now and uh, what you're missing? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just to quickly add to that, uh, don't know if this already exists or not, but is there like a, a source of recipes? So like let's say for example, I want uh, to iterate through all the objects in the scene or I want to start from an object and iterate through all of its children or like just kind of things where it's like, okay, I'm starting to integrate uh, Blender to my pipeline and I know how to do all this stuff in Maya. How do I do you know a lot of these kind of common operations in Blender? I think maybe you, you also there's a lot of examples uh, hidden throughout the whole BPI uh, documentation, and um, uh, for sure there's even even if you're an experienced uh, Blender add-on developer, there's still areas that uh, not, not that you don't know how to code, but it's just the, the way that things work they're not explained. So you, there's uh, problem areas like BGL, the the OpenGL drawing in the, the 3D viewport, and problems in uh, like the new status bar. You can now add icons. I've, I've spent hours trying to add the icons, but I, uh, there's some kind of function that you have to write. I don't know what it returns. So it's a lot of documentation, and uh, there's a lot of examples already in the BPY, BPY uh, documentation. But I think also for me, uh, during the years, I've, I've created a lot of. There's a lot of uh, th things in my code that could definitely be code snippets that I could drop into there, and uh, so I need to push myself to do that also. It's it's it's, it's so easy to to just keep on. Uh, I'm I'm pr problem solving every day, but it's uh, very hard to not just continue coding after you've solved it. Yeah, and then go on. Uh, uh, we need to add that back to the, uh, yeah. the documentation. I was gonna yeah. say to that end, because um, I have the the same thoughts. I mean, I'll be coding for a long time and, and realize, you know, this is interesting stuff that I should probably share. So I've, I've created on GitHub a add-on skeleton um, that, that basically has all of, the, all of the parts that you need to build an add-on. And all you need to do is like drop in like a piece of code into the operator and then you've got the entire add-on already written, written for you. And in, in addition to that, along with some code that I've um, implemented from Rotopaflow's code and some other um, add-ons is like a common a repository of common functions that are often used across like any different any kind of um, uh, problem that you may be encountering like like sampling pixel data on uh, from a UV texture or from generated um, uh, texture coordinates or um, uh, handling images um, like anything that could be like cross-platform from 279 to 280 um, like like for example, grabbing the the context or uh, the dependency graph or updating the scene, all these things, just calling like a simple function that handles both the 279 and the 280 context. Um, so yeah, that that is open source on GitHub, and I I think it'd be really cool to like continue to build on that. Um, I mean, it could be this or it could be something else, but yeah, involve involving the entire community and developing like um, a a, so a, a, co uh, a source of tools that are very common in many different problem-solving context, and this is something that uh, John Denning has worked on through um, the uh, cookie cutter API for user interface, and that's got a lot of common functions as well. Um, so I think that's a worthwhile goal as well. Yeah, so maybe I just come back to the documentation thing, because uh, I remember the wiki being quite hard to use, and uh, it's a bit daunting to uh, put in examples, and um, what mostly works really well for coders is like 
having a repository and then pushing a PR with a new example. So instead of uh, maintaining documentation which is, which is always out of date, um, we might uh, focus on maintaining code as it is because it's faster and um, mostly it's uh, with uh, pull requests and merge requests, it's much better integrated for developers. Don't know if that's an idea maybe. But like you were mentioning the cookie cutter API. Would this be something that we should have in, in Blender itself then? Rather than having it somewhere, also your examples, on a GitHub somewhere. Like, shouldn't we have it like in Blender itself and be part of the, that structure? For example, as a template or maybe something else that is being set up by and then brought in. Yeah, I think as from a template standpoint, a lot of these functions would be uh, excellent examples, like just in terms of like how to, I mean, this is already available in some some resources online, but how to integrate an add-on with 279 and 280 to be able to support, uh, to, to be able to support 279 users as well. Um, and then the great thing about this is uh, with GitHub especially is like you can have this whole community of add-on developers working on this API and helping to document it and helping to add functions that they find might be useful for other developers. And then, yeah, I think I would very much agree that that would be very helpful to have in the templates at least, yeah. Hi, uh, here. <laughs> there are some stuff that I've, I think when I was starting developing add-ons that were a little bit hard for me at the beginning and you mentioned it, but I think autocomplete is something really important uh, in the, Oh, sorry. I, I I think yes, autocomplete is a, a, a real important thing for beginners because, for instance, uh, when you develop uh, Unity games, for instance, you don't look the, at the documentation. You have the documentation the documentation right below your cursor and with the method name, and you can search th search through. And if you know your way around the math stuff and and the usual function that you use for developing stuff. You, you don't need to like go to a web browser and come back to the code. And this speeds up the things and you, you are more motivated by, by what you're actually doing. So I think that's a real important stuff in Blender that could be added. And uh, one other thing is I think like um, the math API, there are stuff that are for beginners a bit daunting, such as the add sign for the matrix stuff or like... Well, that, that's uh, just standard Python nowadays. Yeah, but... Uh, those are stuff that maybe could be um, explained a bit like uh, right away, maybe in the Python console log or stuff like this. So <laughs> well, that's <laughs> tricky because lots of people don't need it. So yeah. if we start explaining too many things up front in your face, then you don't see it anymore. Yes. And yeah. that, that's, that's a problem. And, uh, and the last thing, maybe the control Z uh, in Blender. Often you control Z and it uh, changes the the, the scene and sometimes it removes part of the code in the, in the editor. I think everybody <laughs> had this issue. Uh, so. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to say uh, about the recipe things we were talking about, I thought about the same thing and I made a, a snippets library add-on where you just select a bunch of code and you save in your, uh, in, uh, in your own library. And uh, I thought maybe for the future I wanted to do the thing like an online repository where people can push uh, their own recipes for like uh, little stuff or big stuff like uh, a full operator or just for loops to iterate in on objects. So uh, yeah, just wanted to say that. So maybe uh, we can. I think it shouldn't be too hard to create an add-on that actually integrates with developer.blender.org. Uh, because that also has like a, a paste bin kind of feature where you just go develop to blender.org slash paste. You paste your code as a gist in, in GitHub. You get a P something something number. And then you have something that you can share. So maybe uh, some add-on could integrate with that and then it stays within uh, the, the, the Blender infrastructure. I think if we want to talk about the um, templates that exist within Blender, I think we've lost, I think, I'll be rude here, I think you've lost track of what they're for. If they're there for beginners, if they're there to sort of help you map your first steps, then the comments in them 
need to be far more explanatory about why things are being done the way they are and what they reveal about the architecture that you are within Blender that you are manipulating with this script. Because at the moment, they basically say, here's the function you need, here's another function you need, here's another function you need. Well, I will uh, completely disagree with you here. Okay. Um, because this is not something you do only for beginners. I think this is something that needs to be done throughout all the code, all the add-ons, all the C code, all the C++ code, <laughs> everywhere, for everyone. So, I'll take yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I ran into when I first started doing uh, add-ons was coming at it from an artist, the way you develop add-ons is backwards from the way that I would normally think. So the add-ons are developed functionality first, right? You have the function, does a thing, and then you figure out where that goes in Blender's interface. Whereas normally, the way I would think of it, I make a button, and then when I push the button, then I figure out what the button's supposed to do, right? I have in my mind what it's supposed to do, but I need to know where it's going to go. It's not a design-first approach. Um, so that, that was really a daunting thing for me from a conceptual standpoint. Yeah, yeah I, al I always try to explain it like, look, it's data first. If you think about the data, then the UI and everything flows from it. But people say, oh, I want to have a slider. <laughs> and I say, yeah, but that influences some property of some object and that has a minimum and a maximum value and it's a, maybe it's a distance and so you want to express it in whatever distance unit the user selected. And then you just say to Blender, draw that property and all of a sudden, ta-da, you have your slider and it, it works. But indeed, it is something that, uh, yeah, it needs explaining a lot. I think along the lines of the developer and artist interaction as well. Um, I think a lot of it can be, a lot of it can be on the artist um, to reach out to the developer and, and suggest things like this um, or report, even reporting bugs is, uh, along these lines as well. But um, I think something that I learned when working on the RetopaFlow add-on is how important it is to provide an, a, an, easy, uh, an easy route for an artist to communicate with a developer. Um, say for example, you, there's something like this that you, d that you um, that you think could be improved or tweaked, and maybe you've never heard of GitHub before. Um, <laughs> something that um, I've implemented now, having worked on the RetopaFlow add-on and seeing the infrastructure that's there, is um, whenever the user encounters a bug or encounters something um, that could use some sort of route to a way to communicate to me, um, I've implemented like a button that um, that opens up and it'll say like report error. And then, in fact, this is on the add-on skeleton that I mo uh, mentioned before. Um, it'll send basically. Um, it'll send the uh, the user into a context where they've got a text editor with um, information about how to report the bug or how to request a feature, and then it'll have a link to either a forums page or something like that. So I think that could help to bridge the gap between artists and developers and help to continue the interactions um, that help us become more design first. Um, hi, <laughs> sorry. Pass it along in a second. Um, again, designer turned developer. So um, a lot of the things that people said about templates and the skeleton, that would be great for someone who's just beginning and is not coming from a scripting programming background. Um, I did feel like the learning curve was really not adapted to s someone like me, like so someone that is not coming from that background. And it's part because the documentation is not complete. The API has some inconsistencies. There are a lot of stuff that is just not well documented. But also just when I did start to write code at the beginning, it was really bad code. <laughs> because I just didn't have like best practices. I didn't know how to write code well. And I think that's true for all of us. Yeah, but yeah. That's, that's something that even if like we all experience, maybe we can have like a repository of just like best practices uh, aside from the templates that could help everyone. Just stuff like what you said about um, keeping some of the code outside so you don't have to load everything. Uh, like um, how to use parameters in a smarter way. 
stuff, small stuff like that, I think, could really help a beginner. And if it's in one place and you don't have to go through the internet to look for the one advice that you actually need, maybe even in the Blender Act, like the official <laughs> documentation, that would be really helpful for a beginner, I think. I think something I've found as I've been um, trying to approach these problems, because yes, I'm an artist turned developer, um, is digging through repositories of experienced coders like John Denning here, um, digging through a TopoFlow code when I was working on that. Um, I found that oftentimes examples and like just, just seeing repetitive uses of certain practices, you just kind of start to absorb that. Um, and so I think in some ways, I think a repository with like an uh, like a complete um, like m different methods you can use to solve different problems or just a skeleton of the the best layout that, that we've found as a community to start based on and then including best practices in the way that it's used I think a lot of that could be absorbed via osmosis just as you're coding in this infrastructure and as you start to and I mean some of it comes with time as well but as you start to to see these things repeated over and over again, both in your own code, in the skeleton, and perhaps other people's code that you're digging through for examples. I think some of this comes uh, naturally through that process. Um, I'd like to respond to that. Um, the idea is nice, but uh, perhaps uh, this is not a great idea for somebody who's just starting out as an artist, and uh, not as an artist, uh, as a coder, and um, start as an artist because um, they might not be able to judge what's good code and what's bad code and there's a lot of code out there a lot of add-ons being developed and when it comes to best practice it's probably a better idea to have somebody either from, from the Blender Foundation or somebody who's really experienced um, who, who writes best practice because otherwise it's really hard to find um, what's good code because um, I, I mean we have a lot of stuff on, on, on Blender artists on Blender Stack Exchange all these forums and not everything is good so um, if you're absorbing the wrong practices that's perhaps not a good idea right um, I'm just trying to be mindful of time I know there's lots of other questions uh, I will certainly be around I think everyone else will be around you look around, there's lots of developers. So I don't think that even though we're going to be closing down this particular panel, we should stop this conversation. There, I had, this actually ended up being way richer than what I had expected, which is great. Um, I think there's still lots more to, to discuss. You know, how do we start collecting the, uh, you know, the snippets for the newcomers, for those that have been around for a while? Um, start sharing ideas about unique ways that we're using, uh, you know, ray tracing, for example, to solve all sorts of different problems. Uh, I think there, there's, uh, we should definitely form a community and, and grow this um, and make Blender add-on development ours. So, uh, <laughs> um, thank you all. Um, I do want to be mindful of the next next group starting here in just a couple minutes, but. Um, Thank you for the discussion, and we'll be around to answer more questions.